Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman, and when I started this YouTube channel about four years ago, I got going because a lot of things that used to cost a lot of money suddenly came down in price, and we're seeing more and more of this professional grade technology becoming more in reach of people like me that have a relatively limited budget. This is the Teradek VidDU Go, and they let me borrow this for a couple of days to check out. Now what this is, is a streaming box where you take your video and pop it into the HDMI or the SDI connector here, and then the box will encode that video and allow you to stream it on most of the major services out there like YouTube and Twitch and Facebook. But what this box does in addition to that is allow you to connect up multiple cellular radios to the mix and then bond multiple connections together. So not only can you get a more reliable stream, but you can also stream at a higher bit rate than you could out of any of these connections individually. It allows you to really uh, take advantage of the aggregate bandwidth you have available to you. So we're going to explore how this works. Uh, there's the hardware component, of course, but there's also a cloud service that Teradek has that makes all of this stuff actually uh, work in practice. So we're going to look at both of those components in this review. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this is on loan from Teradex. So when we're done with this, it goes back to them, unfortunately. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get to it now and see what this device is all about. So let's take a closer look now at the hardware. We've got three different components connected right now. We've got the main VidDU unit, which costs $1,490. And then connected to it are two of their node modems. Uh, these cost $400 a piece, and they connect up to most of the major cellular networks that are out there. So one thing you might want to do is maybe have one on AT&T and the other one on Verizon so that you can get multiple networks going in addition to whatever you're connecting the main uh, module to. Now, what separates the VidDU Go here from the much less expensive VidDU Pro is that the Go supports HEVC compression, so you can get a better quality video sent out to the cloud uh, at a lower bit rate. That's one advantage. Uh, the other advantage here is that you have two USB ports for connecting up these modems, or you can also connect other modems as well that are compatible. Uh, these would be mobile hotspots, for example, some of those little uh, jump drive connector things that you can get from your carrier. I'll put a link down below to where you can get a compatibility list so you don't have to spend the 400 bucks on one of these. If you already have a working modem, you can just pop it into the USB port and go from there. Additionally, you can connect the unit here up to multiple smartphones and have them be the hotspots. So that's another option you can pursue as well. So you have a lot of connectivity options here. Uh, the big advantage are the two uh, USB ports on this one versus only a single one on the VidEU Pro and of course the HEVC compression. I don't think it's too unreasonable for what they're delivering to be able to get a really nice camera mountable unit uh, that incorporates all of that. Uh, you also have a micro SD card slot here, so you can set the uh, video go here to record in addition to stream. So whatever it's streaming out, it can write to the card. So you have a backup in case your stream goes down and you want to upload the recording later. That's an option you can pursue. Uh, you can plug in HDMI sources. It'll support up to 1080p at 60 frames per second. Uh, so you can connect a camera to it if you want. If you're out in the field with uh, you know, OBS or some video switcher, you can plug its output into that if you want to do that. Uh, you also have an SDI connector, which is another differentiator here with the Go versus the Pro. Uh, this is not on the Pro, and it'll allow you to hook up connections that are coming out of an SDI source. You have gigabit Ethernet here for connecting up to your Ethernet networks. Uh, this connector here is an audio input, so if you don't have audio coming through your cameras, you can have it come in separately via this connector. I tried that out when I was doing a test the other day. It worked fine. And you have a headphone jack here for monitoring what the uh, video go here is receiving. You also have a USB Type-C port here for power. Now, there is a battery built into this. Uh, but it's not going to last you all that long. So you'll probably want to have a USB-C power source with you uh, when you're out and about. They say you get about two hours with it, and that might be an accurate estimate when you're in ideal conditions, but we were out in a weak signal area with both modems attached, and we were watching that battery indicator drop pretty quickly. So I think your mileage on battery life will uh, vary quite a bit depending on how you're using the device. 
Uh, so my advice would be to make sure you've got that power source with you just to be safe so your stream doesn't get interrupted by a dead battery right in the middle of a sporting event or something along those lines. Now to use the Video Go to its highest potential, you do need to go through the Teradek core service to do your streaming. They have another service called ShareLink that has some of these features, but I think it costs more to use than Core does. And if you want to be able to use the HEVC encoder on the video go, you have to go through Core. So we're going to focus on Core uh, as we go through some of the features here. Now there is no monthly fee for using this service, but you pay as you go depending on what you need. So for the video go here, uh, this is the breakdown of what charges you can expect. It's 50 cents per gigabyte of data received by the core service. So when you turn on your video go, it will begin transmitting to core if it's set up to work with core. All of that data going in, even if you're not streaming out, will be charged at that rate. And then when you start sending video to your video providers, that video comes from the core cloud server, not from your device directly, and they'll charge you another 50 cents per gigabyte outbound. Uh, so essentially it's about a dollar per gigabyte and depending on how you configure your video go will determine how much data you're going to use i'll show you how to do that in a minute so you could probably figure out what the costs are going to be as you get uh, all of your uh, streams set up and you know what kind of bit rates you're going to be using now there's also an additional charge if you are using the hevc encoder on the video go because that video has to get converted in the cloud first before it goes out to YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and other services that currently don't support HEVC. Uh, that they charge you at a rate of $3 per hour. Now because I am not streaming live at this very moment, I'm not being billed for that. But once I start streaming, that encoder spins up and then you'll be getting that charge. Now there are a bunch of other things that Core can do. Uh, these are things that are usually reserved for their professional grade clients here. So this is uh, something that I think you would get into if you did get really serious about your streaming here. But for our purposes of a YouTube channel or a game streamer, we're going to stick with the basics here. And it's not all that expensive to uh, get stuff streamed out. Now, of course, you still have your data charges on the cellular devices. So if you are uh, hot spotting to your phone, for example, those data rates will apply. Whatever your monthly fees are for those cellular connections on your modems will also apply. But as far as core is concerned, uh, look at it at about a, a dollar or gigabyte uh, for the in and the out, uh, and you'll be uh, pretty much ready to go. And then again, if you're using HEVC to send your video in, you'll have an additional encoding charge. And one other note on the differentiation between the Video Go and Pro. Uh, the Video Pro does not support the core service, which again looks like it's less expensive than the ShareLink service. So if you are looking at this as a long-term investment, you might end up saving in the long run by going with the more expensive Video Go. I'm going to jump back to the dashboard here uh, and look at what we've got. So here is my Video Go. I've got some uh, video being fed in right now from my uh, TriCaster. And this is what Core is currently receiving. So what's cool about the Core control panel is that you can be out in the field on your phone and actually monitoring and adjusting your stream from the app or from a web browser. Uh, you can also connect directly to the video itself, which I'll show you in a few minutes, but I was really impressed with the ability to uh, be able to get in there and really see a lot of neat stuff here. So what I have done is I set up my Facebook page and my YouTube channel here for live streaming. So if I wanted to go live on either one of these services or both, I just click on go live and it will start. So for example, if I wanted to go uh, stream over to my uh, YouTube channel, I have it going to my extras channel at the moment, It'll say starting, it looks like it has started. I'll switch over to my control panel here. And sure enough, my YouTube stream is reporting that uh, everything is out and being broadcast. And that is it. It's pretty quick and easy once you get everything uh, configured. And it really isn't that difficult. Now, what I can also do here is jump into the settings on my video and I can change the codec. I can change the video quality as far as bit rate and frame rate are concerned. Uh, the Video Go also has a built-in uh, encoding device, so you could go from 1080i to 1080p, for example. So you have a lot of flexibility here for setting things up. They have a bunch of presets as well. So right now I have it on high, which is, I think, a 720p connection running at uh, 2 megabits per second. But I could go to custom here and get it to exactly where I want it to be. I could go to 1080, for example, at a higher bit rate if I wanted. I can change my audio sources as well. So right now it's going through the HDMI, but I could set it up for that 
uh, audio or the analog input we saw a little bit earlier. I can adjust the audio bit rate. If I go over here to connection, I can also set some of the limits for uh, buffering on it as well. So you have a lot of things that you can configure the device with directly, even though uh, you're connecting through the core service to do that. What I have found, though, is that when I make a change, like to the frame rate or the bit rate, uh, it sometimes will have to reset the video connection, which might end your stream. So I would strongly urge you uh, to do all of this configuration before you actually start streaming, just to prevent your stream from getting interrupted. But once you get these services set up here, that's it, you're good to go. Now, what I did with these services is I set them up as RTMP connections because it gives me more flexibility. Uh, but you do have the option when you go into destinations and to channels here uh, to set them up with a direct account connection to the service you're trying to use. Uh, with YouTube, if you set it up and attach it to your account, it's going to require you to have events scheduled on the live streaming platform. And if you're doing that already, that's fine. You shouldn't have any issues connecting. But I like to do that stream on demand thing, uh, which does not work currently through the YouTube option here. So I just set up my manual RTMP connection, and uh, that seemed to work just fine. So you do have uh, plenty of options here for getting yourself set up. And that's it. Once you get that stuff in there, uh, it's running. Now I want to switch over to the mobile app real quick so you can see how this might work out in the field. Now you have all the features you just saw on the web version, but I think the information is actually a little bit better presented here on the mobile app. So you can see right now that we are uh, broadcasting at uh, essentially 30p, 1080, HEVC out to the core service, and then uh, you get a better window here of the data rate and which devices are contributing to what. So right now the uh, video is on the other side of the room with a really bad cellular connection. You can see at the bottom there what modem 1 and modem 2 are uh, providing to the mix here. And then you can see a bulk of the connection here is relying upon my uh, Wi-Fi connection over my Comcast service. And what I found when I was out in the field with this is that uh, it's very good at dynamically adjusting bandwidth depending on what the conditions are. So earlier, uh, we went down to the Connecticut River. Uh, initially, I started off just relying on the two modems that were attached to the side of the video. We were doing actually the same stream I'm doing at the moment, which was HEBC, 2 megabit. Uh, and what it was doing was splitting the connection between those two modems evenly. Uh, they both had a very good connection. You can see what that looks like here. Then I tethered my phone to it in the middle of the stream, and then it balanced it out. It actually split it up evenly over the three different devices, and my phone is on Verizon. So we were bringing in some of the data from Verizon, some of the data from AT&T, and everything just seems to work. It was pretty seamless, and when I turned my phone off, it just relied on the modems again. Uh, so it's really good at balancing out these connections, and it might even work in situations like I'm in right now, uh, where my Comcast connection is not always that reliable and I have these little uh, stutters that happen from time to time that knock the stream off. Uh, this is a situation where even with this lousy connection here, those two little modems might be able to give me enough to keep me from going dark uh, during one of my live streams. And if you're having trouble like that, uh, this might be something worth considering to solve that issue. Now, another thing I wanted to try to do was exceed the bandwidth of any of the individual connections. And what you're looking at here is a test live stream that I did the other day. I'll put a link to this down below in the video description. Uh, we had a 10 megabit per second Comcast connection available to us, but this stream was 15 megabits per second uh, HEVC over to the core service, which of course then uh, was sending it out to Facebook and YouTube simultaneously. I think the detail looks great. The water here looks great for sure. And it was neat to watch how the device segmented out the bandwidth based on what connection options it had available to it. And you can see what that uh, chart looks like here as this stream was going. So it was very easy to do once I got everything set up and I dialed in the bandwidth that I wish to have on my stream. It just kind of figured things out for me. And I'm really pleased with the overall detail here of the shot. It almost looks like an on-demand video that I uploaded, but what you're watching here is in fact uh, the live stream that the viewers watched uh, while it was going. And one of the things that I really like about this as I've been playing with it uh, is that you don't have to worry about it. Once you have some confidence that the bandwidth that you have available to you in the aggregate can cover the stream that you want to do, uh, it will take care of things in the background, which is very helpful for one-man bands like mine, uh, where I don't really have time to monitor all the technology in addition to doing the stream. Uh, this really gives you some peace of mind, and it might be worth the investment in both the hardware and the uh, service charges to have something that works for you uh, when you turn it on. Now, you don't have to use the core service, so if you do want to 
connect directly to YouTube, for example, you can do that through the VDU app that you see right here. Uh, so to turn it off, what you do is go into Settings and Cloud, and then go to None for Cloud Service and Apply. And what will happen here is it will disconnect me from Core, first of all, uh, but then it will give me the options now to be able to connect to some of the other services. But remember, when we do this, uh, we lose the bonded connection capability. And in my opinion, you may as well go with the VDU Pro, which costs a lot less if you don't intend on using the cloud services with this device. It really uh, kind of needs the service to get uh, its full potential. Uh, so now that we've turned off the cloud, I can go over here to broadcast and I can uh, choose my platform. So I can set up a new destination here and just like we saw on the core service, I can choose to connect directly with one of my accounts to a streaming service or I can go uh, with a direct RTMP connection for uh, some of the other things I might want to do. And remember, because we have turned off the core service, we also can only stream now to one provider at a time. So if I go into broadcast settings here and select platform, uh, if I go from Facebook to RTMP here, it is one or the other, not both. So again, if you're trying to get the most out of this device, you probably will want to uh, connect it up to the core service or their share link service. Uh, quality here is the same as you saw before, just now on the device directly with its app. I can set my bit rate here. I can do a custom bit rate like we did before, which was what I had set up when we were at the beach. I can have the audio uh, bit rate adjusted here as well and, and do the frame rate too. Again, you've got a transcoder built in here to make all of this happen inside the box. So it's pretty convenient to dial in what you're looking for and uh, get the output quality there. And what's also cool is that you can make some adjustments right on the front control panel here. So if you don't have a phone available to you or you can't get it connected to the video, uh, you do have the ability to jump in here and uh, make some adjustments uh, on the fly. In fact, when we were doing that live stream by the river, I actually connected to my iPhone's Wi-Fi using the front panel here. So it's kind of a fail safe that you have this if everything else fails. In fact, if you got out there and you just can't get anything working and you've got it all configured, uh, you can just hit the red button here to uh, start streaming out to the services automatically if you need to. So you do have uh, the ability to control things even if the apps just don't seem to be working for you that day. So lots of uh, convenience there. So overall, I am quite pleased with this device. It worked exceptionally well out in the field in our testing. Uh, we did that stream down by the Connecticut River that was kind of a modest bit rate, two megabits per second. It split things up evenly between the two modems and then we were able to add my phone to the mix on the fly and it just handled all of it in the background. It was really cool to see how that worked. However, the product doesn't do much uh, without that core service driving everything. Uh, the core service, I think, is pretty reasonable for what you're getting. Uh, there's no monthly fee. You do pay by the gigabyte in and out. But again, I'm not seeing it being a terribly expensive thing, especially if you're doing a more modest 720p at 2 megabits per second, for example. It shouldn't add too much to your budget. Uh, you do, of course, have to account for all the data plans you need to get everything working. I also like the fact that you don't need to buy these expensive modems if you already have something that can work. Now, as for me, I've been very discouraged about doing live streaming on this channel because of the unreliable internet connection I have currently from Comcast. Whenever I do a live stream, uh, we might be going for a good 20, 30 minutes, and then it just starts breaking up. We lose the stream for 20 or 30 seconds, it comes back, and I lose viewers, and it gets very frustrating. And one of the things that I've come to discover about this bonding uh, feature of the video go here is that it actually works really well, and I think it could keep my stream alive, even if there was a bit of a hit in the bit rate along the way, versus having me disappear completely. And I think there's some value to perhaps investing in this box and seeing if this might allow us to do more streaming on this channel, which I think some of you might want to see. Now, I don't think I need the two modems on here. What I would probably do is uh, buy the center unit here uh, and then bond my uh, Verizon iPhone with it and then use the iPhone kind of as my fail safe should something happen with the Comcast connection because typically my Comcast drops, dropouts are brief but they're long enough that it knocks me off. Uh, there should be enough bandwidth on the phone here if I put it in the right spot in the house to kind of keep me online until the Comcast connection comes back and that's one of the things that I was really uh, pleased about in testing this was just how well it manages 
all of this for you in the background. You don't have to think about allocating bandwidth to different devices. It just does it for you. And I think the core service is pretty reasonable, especially if you don't do the HEVC encoding. At that point, you just pay for the data in and out. And I think by my math here, it would only be a couple of bucks to do an hour or so live stream, which I think might be worth it, especially if the stream doesn't get interrupted. So I might pick up the uh, box here and let you know uh, how it all works out. And if I do buy the box for about 1400 bucks, I probably might be motivated to do more live streams to try to recoup some of that investment. So stay tuned. I think we might finally get there with this thing. This might actually be the solution to the problem that we've had for quite some time. Uh, so stay tuned. We'll have more on that to come. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, The Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht, Anuj Zaveri, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.